streaming process, so welcome to uh, making friends with SAS, as I call this. Um, the backstory behind this lecture is that when I started at the University of Nebraska, that was my first faculty job, I taught a, an earlier version of this class to people who had never seen SAS before. And I tried to teach them SAS at the same time I was teaching them multi-level models, and it went very badly. So the next year, I offered a summer course um, it was in, it, we had a system called Seminets, like little one credit, like special topics things we did in the summer, and I called it Make Friends with SAS. And I strongly encouraged anybody who was going to come to this course to go to that first so that we could figure out just how do you get your data in? How do you make a variable? Just basic things like that that can stump you that have nothing to do with the models but are prerequisites. And so that's what, uh, that's where this started from. Um, as I said before, I have to pick something to teach in because I can't help you learn how to use these models without doing it in a software package. So um, that's, that's my rationale. It's, the course is not going to be about SAS, but you have to know just a little bit to follow along. Um, that being said, the survey I took, folks were using other programs, so what do you typically use? You use R? R for you as well? What do you use? A mix of R and SAS. Mix of R and SAS? Not good idea. Fair enough. How about you? R? So I'm going to be, tomorrow morning, I am actually going to be auditing Jonathan's class so that I can learn R. Okay, so this is just like a swap. Um, I have resisted learning R as long as I possibly could, and now it is just time to drink the Kool-Aid and, and get with the program, I think. But for today, it's SAS. Tomorrow, I will be sitting in your shoes, quite literally. So the more languages you learn, though, I think the easier it is to pick up each extra one because it's the same concepts over and over again. Um, the reason that I gravitate towards SAS is actually not just the models, um, but it's also the programming aspect. SAS has ways to make things um, automated in much the same way that R does, things like loops and, you know, packages that you can write that do, you know, snippets of various things to make um, to make things like reporting results easier. You can make tables and stuff like that. So I learned how to do all of that in SAS, you know, 10 years ago, and now I get to relearn how to do it in R so that I can communicate with everyone else. So that being said, I can read R code. Like if you want to try to fit the same models that we're doing in class in Elmer, I could probably help you read it, but I can't write it. I'm familiar enough with it, and I'm familiar with what it's trying to do that I can help you a little bit. Um, that being said, on the book's website, which is linked from my main page here, uh, there was a student a couple of years ago, so my postdoc advisor used my book in his course, which I thought was super cool, and their students used R, and his GTA translated several of the examples from the book into R for the class, and she let me have her files. So there's a link to them via GitHub, so you're welcome to have those resources. I haven't verified them or checked them, but I'm assuming that they're correct. So that's another resource. And eventually, once I get better, then there'll be another column out here with R to go with the set, but not today. Today is SAS. So, so uh, we're going to be using SAS through the virtual machine. Are you guys familiar with how to do that already? Okay, cool. Well, let's open that up then. This I had to learn just last week. The, uh, but I think this is a pretty neat system that you guys have access to all this stuff no matter where you are. Um, oh, it wants me to download, uh, download my stuff. Sure, why not? I have to get a receiver. Excuse me for one moment. You can do it. It's thinking about it. It's thinking very hard, apparently. So, here we go. Next. Okay. 
So um, just like a lot of other programs, the SAS syntax files, the .sas extension, that's just a text file. So you can open it in any text editor and edit it and look at it, even if you don't have, if you're not working within SAS. Um, the only catch is that if you use it um, in Word, anytime that there's quotes, Word changes them to the quotes that, you know, that bend in the formatted quotes, and that throws SAS for a loop. So I would recommend some kind of plain text editor like a notepad or text pad or something like that, um, rather than formatted text editors like Word. So well, while this is uh, thinking about stuff, I will open up the rest of the files here. So I have included in your download packet um, some extra just resource files. So I have a, a document here about SAS syntax that we can look at while I'm waiting for this to, to install itself. Um, the first part of this is my argument for why you need syntax at all. I'm assuming I don't have to make that argument with this group. You're used to syntax as opposed to pointing and clicking. Is that fair to say? Okay, so yes, syntax helps with reproducibility. It helps with automation. So syntax is a beautiful thing. Um, in SAS syntax, like most other programming languages, it's color coded. So it helps you. Um, comments are green, and I'll show you how to make those. Built-in SAS commands are going to be two different shades of blue. Um, anything that is in this pinky purple color is going to be case and space sensitive. That's one thing to remember. This is where titles go, um, references to paths to find files and things like that. Um, if you were to enter data, I'm not sure when you would ever need to do that, but there's a few occasions that will show up as a yellow background. Anything that is user specific, so names of variables, names of data sets, things like that that you would change is going to be entered in black. And if at any point your syntax turns red, it's wrong. So if you forget a terminator, which in SAS is a semicolon at the end of each line, the next thing you'll see is red, which indicates it doesn't understand what you're trying to say. Still installing. Okay, good. Um, SAS has a system for storing SAS-specific files that's known as a library. I'm guessing that there's something similar in R. A library is a named place where your files are stored. The only catch is that it's only valid for SAS files. So I will show you a workaround that is the same concept with other kinds of files. Um, one big thing that is new to folks who come from SAS from SVSS in SPSS, if you have your data open and you do something to it, you can save it. Or if you do something to it and you mess up and you don't want that done, you can just close it before you're saving it. So there's this um, you know, back door. If something happens, you can get out of it. In SAS, transformations happen immediately. So if you screw up your data set, it's screwed up. Scary, huh? So to work around this, what I will have you do, what I always do, is to copy the data set that you're working with that's stored in your permanent directory to a temporary directory that's called work. Then you do whatever you want to the thing in the work. If you screw it up, fine. Read it back in, start over. That way you also don't have to save multiple versions of a data set. If you're working with an analysis and you only need to analyze certain cases, you can drop them, work with it in work, and they're still saved safe and sound in your permanent location. So for that reason, I always work in work. Um, one nice thing that's uh, in SAS, I'm not sure if this translates to R, but I imagine it does. Whenever you're trying to do something to a data file, you have to say which one it is. Now that seems sort of obvious, but again, in SPSS, what happens is that you can have multiple data sets open at the same time. And if you write syntax to make a new variable, for instance, which data set it goes to is which one your mouse clicked on last, which one is active. If you want to send it to a particular data set, you write a line of code that changes which one is active, and then you do it. So it's this um, kind of kludgy process of how you tell it which, which data set things go to in SAS. It's data equals, and it's hard coded. So that's one thing that's nice. So we will have basically two types of commands. There's a data step in which you are doing things to data, importing it, um, making new variables, sorting it, that sort of thing. 
And then there are procs. So these are procedures. They're ways of asking for information, either analyses, descriptive, statistics, and so forth. Um, let's see, the rest of this is just sort of advice. Here's a list of troubleshooting things. If something doesn't work, you can go through and make sure that each of these is true. Do I have something yet? Hooray! Add account. Um, let's see, my word enter my email. Sure thing, you Iowa. Uh, yeah, I trust the server. Don't, don't you think? I'm in bad shape if I don't. Okay, got it. Thank you. No, I thought I already did this. Yeah, you know what my hawk ID is? It's my name without the A. That is going to drive me nuts, I think. All right. Now I can catch up to you. Uh, the rest of the documents in here um, are about either macro programming, and this one is also how to get uh, files in and out of SAS in terms of output, and I'll have some examples of that that we'll work with today, but this is just an, another document that will is a, a reference for you to get. Um, finally, last but not least, while we're talking about references, on my books website, for each of the um, programs that I'm, I reference here, this first row right here has a general notes about the program. And so like this document right here is a 17 page sort of manual that explains all of the codes that are used in the book. That way I don't have to annotate every single example. So I have a link to that um, from the course web page as well. So if you're ever wondering what a command does and you don't want to look it up in the SAS documentation, which can be sort of challenging, um, you can look it up there. So that's another resource that you have. Here we go. All right. So let's, so I have already tried to do this. So it's starting up. Um, in addition to this system at the University of Iowa, SAS also has a product called SAS University Edition. It's a free copy of SAS that runs through a virtual machine, very much the same as this type of technology. Any student or faculty member at any university can download it for free. So after you leave, <laughs> assuming you have an email address someplace and your university doesn't have SAS or you don't want to, you can't pay for it, that's another option for you um, to be able to continue to use it. Okay, so does everybody have something like this in front of them? Are we ready to make friends with SAS? Why not? First thing we have to do is figure out all of these different windows. So this is probably somewhat analogous to RStudio. Do you guys use that? Yep, so it's a similar type of interface. We have the log where whatever you've done will be echoed back to, good or bad. Um, blue in the log is usually good, black is good, red is bad. If it's angry with you, it will be red. Editor is where you type things for your syntax. I'm going to have us open uh, the file that I made for you here in just a second to fill this window. Um, for reasons that are unclear to me, there's this other window for output. This is like old school text output that is no longer the default in these systems. Um, you can just go ahead and close it because we won't need that for anything. Over here on the left panel, these are two windows that you can toggle back and forth. This results is going to be a tree diagram of all of the different pieces of output that you can navigate through once you have some. The other one here is Explorer, and this is where you can find your files. So what I had to do to be able to figure out how to get my SAS, existing SAS syntax file in this thing was just start from my PC. So if you go to that, go to the folder location where you saved the stuff from today, please. And it can be easier if in here if you go to view and use list, that way you can see the full names. So I know I mine is in my Dropbox where I have a folder for this class. And there's all of my files. 
And so I want you to open the file that ends in .sas that's called Make Friends with SAS. And it should show up right there. So we don't need uh... So you can either edit this file directly or you can copy things and make your own version. It's up to you. But I will just make this down here. And I am going to change the size of my font so that you can read it a little better. So under Tools and Options, there's a Preferences tab. I think, is that where it is? Nope, it's in the other one. It is under Enhanced Editor. There we go. How about 16 point font? There. Is that big enough or should it be bigger? A little bigger? Yeah. Or you could not sit in the back, right? <laughs> That's the other option, but just saying. Oh, I'll make it a little bigger. Let's go with 18 point font. A little bigger? Okay. Is that better or do I need it bigger? That's okay? All right. All right, so do we have, everybody have this. You should see lots of green words. So uh, this first section is just illustrating different ways that you can write comments. That way you can leave notes to yourself about what you're doing. So single lines, the beginning of a comment is an asterisk, and the end of the line is a semicolon. If you want to comment big chunks of code, that's like this right here, a, a note that takes up multiple lines. It's a slash and a star on the front end, and then the reverse of it, star slash. So that way you can take notes as I'm talking. And, and although most of the things that I'm saying in here should be here. Let's see here, why does this not want to scroll? So these are the demonstration of the colors here. A few rules about names of SAS files. So SAS files have names that have two parts, just like people have first and last names. This one, the first part, is where the file is, what library it's in. So it's either in work, which is the default, which is a temporary directory, or it's in some place that you have to define where it is and name it. After that comes a period, and then after that comes the name of the data file, and I believe you have up to 32 characters maybe. Uh, the usual rules apply. The only special characters you're allowed is underscore, and it can't start with the number. So the first thing that I want to teach you is how to make a SAS library. That is how to tell it where your SAS files are. So I am going to turn on line numbers in this as well. If you go to the tools menu and then options, I think it's under advanced editor. Let me see, is it that one? Nope, it must be the other one. There's two ways to get to settings and I always pick the wrong one. It must be under preferences. So tools menu, last options, and then preferences. Under view, I think, is it? Where was it? I swear it used to be here, goodness. Okay, that's not it. Let me keep digging until I find it. Not system. Nope. No, I don't need help, actually. Go away. There. Under Enhanced Editor, I found it. There's an option for Show Line Numbers. Let's turn that on, that way I can refer to the line that we're on. It makes it easier to keep track. Okay. So I'm starting here on uh, line 49. You with me? 
Everybody? Okay, cool. So I have three different examples here of what these statements will look like depending on the platform you're accessing SAS from. So if you have SAS on your actual desktop, not virtual, but if it's installed, it'll look like this. Here's the second option, which is the one that we're going to use. And the question is, how do you know what comes first? How do you know what it thinks your file location is? And this I had to figure out myself. So this folder that I pulled this syntax file from, do you see this little part at the top right here? On mine, it's the C drive where this is stored. So you'll want to take this little text right here and change what's in here to match what you have. So this location is where my files are. You're going to want to take that text and add it to this line right here instead. So I'm guessing it's slash slash client is the common part, and then another slash, and then it will point to where it is on your machine. So in SAS, um, just like in a lot of other programs, you have the option to execute just lines of code at a time or the whole thing. We're only going to do lines. So once you have changed the directory to where it's going to be on yours, highlight those lines here. You can highlight the comment or not, it's up to you. And now I will point out the top of this thing here. See these little icons? <laughs> In the worst human factors decision, maybe, for wor maybe worst or second worst, I'm not sure, in the history of the world, the, do you see this little dude here? That's the running man. That means make it go. What's next to him? The delete key. <laughs> so if you don't have excellent mousing skills, the alternative is F3, the keyboard shortcut to make it go. And it will blink and you're like, okay, did it work? Here's how you find out. We'll go to the log. At the bottom of your window here, you can go to the log tab. And what you should see is if it worked, it'll say it's successfully assigned. Now mine hasn't worked. Apparently it is not happy with me. So it says SAS path does not exist. So why doesn't mine exist? Do you, does your guys's exist or is it mad at you? It exists? Does it say successfully assigned? Okay, see SAS wants to build self-efficacy. Wants you to make it feel good that you've gotten it to work. Now my question is why doesn't mine work? This is my file. Let me see what, if I, did I call it something wrong? Yep, I think. No? Oh. Hello. Uh -huh. Probably. Now I have to figure out why it can't find mine. Slash slash client. Slash. C. Slash. Select Dropbox. Oh, I know why. I know why. Okay. This is actually a really good teaching opportunity for me. Remember what I said about this pinky purple color? Case and space sensitive. So if it doesn't, so when you get an error like this, that it says, uh, where did it go? SAS path does not exist. It's like, I can't find this. Probably means you have the name wrong. It's misspelled or otherwise. And I just caught what I did. I have an extra underscore that I forgot to type right here. That. <laughs> I forgot an underscore, which means that this one down here would be wrong too, so I'll fix that. Now let me try again. 
run it, F3. Hey, you were supposed to work that time. Now I'm checking it again. Dropbox 19 PSQF 7375. Oh, I don't have the longitudinal part. That's why. I need to be more consistent in how I name things, apparently. And finally. Third time's the charm. SAS path was successfully assigned as follows. Yes. Doesn't Yours doesn't work either. OK, so it's got to be, uh, <laughs> yep, it's, we got to find, OK, let's check here where it's pointing to. Client. Uh, yours, so it needs to match that. Oh, exactly. Okay, that's what the problem is. Yeah. So now it knows what SAS path means. That's my name. You can call this anything you want, but I picked this name because I thought it was uh, explanatory, right? This is the path to the SAS files. You can have as many libraries as you want. So you can define multiple different places simultaneously and use each of them. Um, on SAS University Edition, the slashes go the other way, even if you're in Windows. So just as a heads up if you ever use that. So uh, my first task for us then here is let's make a library name yourself, which is what you've already done. So and I said make a library from your name. So if I want to, to change the name of my library, what do I need to change in this line here on 61? SAS path. Yes, so I'm going to name my library Lisa, for instance. Now, where is it? To find it in the windows. Okay, so did you get that, Harry? It works? Okay, great. Move your cursor back over to Explorer here. And once this side window is active, there's this little yellow folder up thingy. Folder up, folder up, folder up, folder up, until you get back to where we started, which is libraries, file shortcuts, favorite folders, and PC. Libraries is the one that has like a yellow filing cabinet. Double click on that yellow filing cabinet. And now you will see all of the libraries that are available to you by default, which includes work, SAS user, SAS help, and so forth, and here's SAS path. That's the ones that we defined. So if you have successfully assigned it, you should have one here. And you can always double click in it and see what's there. So the list helps illustrate the purpose of these lib name statements. It is to identify SAS data files only. That folder, though, that location has a bunch of other files. So I'm going to teach you another way to tell SAS about those files as well. So we will do that here in just a moment. So any questions so far? Cool. So let's practice importing a SAS file into the work library. So here is your first example online. Uh, I'm on 69 here. Should be this little chunk of code of what's known as a data step. It consists of three parts, data, set, and run. Run is like execute in, in SPSS, it's like make it go. Is there an analog in R? Like a completing sentence? <laughs> no, no. Click it, hit the button, okay. Well, you have to say it. So to help you remember of this, think of like the run as the please at the end of a request. Like my son is three and he's like, mommy, can I have a drink? I'll say, I can't hear you. Mommy, can I have a drink, please? Like, oh, now I, now I heard you. I can activate this command. So run is like the please at the end. So the order of these things is counterintuitive to some extent. When you type the data command here, what you are saying is make me a new data set. The data set that you are creating then is listed in the next piece here, which is the two part name, where it's going, which is the work temporary library dot what it's called. So if I just had this part right here, 
I would have created a brand new empty data set called new SAS file. The next part then is, okay, if you want a new data set, what do you want to put in it? Well, I would like to put in it this one. So the word set means from. I would like to put in my new SAS file in the work library, the contents of my old SAS file, which is stored in SAS path, a permanent directory, and it's called old SAS file. So functionally, what these three lines do is save as. Saves a copy. That's what you're doing. So the first line is where is it going? Second line is where is it coming from? Third line, please. If you see a reference to a data set without the period in front of it, that means work. The default is work. Um, I try to always put work here explicitly, that way it's clear, but if you ever see this, that line, new data, new SAS file, and this line, data work.new SAS file, are the same. So let's practice this. Let's copy that three line thing here. I would like you to import the data set that is stored over here called SAS practice. So what do we need to change? Well, SAS path is what our library is called. Let's change that to the one that you made. For instance, my name here. The second part, that's what the file is. So this is to be called SAS practice. That's the name of my file. Where it's going then is the first part, work new SAS file. Now you can rename it if you want to. Let's keep the name the same. So it should look like this, data work.sasspractice semicolon set lisa.sasspractice be your name instead up to eight characters semicolon run semicolon. Uh, SAS doesn't care about lines so you can you can shove it all onto one line if you want like that. You can let it go all the way off the page. This is just sort of the custom when you see other people's SAS code, what it looks like. So you can indent it or not, however you see fit. Um, also, you don't have to type capital letters. This is my convention for teaching purposes. Anything that is a dedicated SAS command is in capitals. Anything that you would have to change is in lowercase. So that will help you keep, keep these things straight in addition to um, the, uh, what do you call it, the color scheme. So if I forget a semicolon, for instance, right here, note that run is grayed out. If things aren't the right color, then you have a problem somewhere. So the colors can help you troubleshoot as well. All right. So if this works, we run it, hit F3. Uh-oh, Lisa is not assigned. So I have an error here. Note what color it is. It's red. It's angry with me. Lisa is not assigned because I did not run that code after I wrote it. So I wrote this line, but never actually activated it. So we'll do that. Now I'll try again. And it will tell you how many observations you have, how many variables you have, and so forth. So now there are two copies of the same data set. The original is in this SAS practice location, the place where you downloaded files to today. If you folder up in your explorer on the left, the work library then, if you click on that, now you have a copy of it here. So the logic is that any data transformations you would want to do, adding cases, merging, making variables, do it to the copy that's in work. To export 
a data set to SAS. So let's say that you want to do a bunch of data transformations and you need to send the final product to a colleague. You need to export. It is the reverse of the code for importing. So I'm on line 90-ish uh, here. Everybody with me? So data, again, means make me a new data set. So this is where is it going. I want to send it in the SAS path place and call it SAS file saved. Where is it coming from? The version that's in work. So this is save as the reverse, taking the file that you've been working with and saving it back out to a permanent file that you can then access in your folder. So let's practice this here. Copy paste. Save the data set SAS practice as SAS final. So I'm actually going to start with the second line here. Which one am I working with? It's going to be SAS practice that we saved to the work library. Let's pretend we did a bunch of stuff to it. <laughs> and now we want to save the final product. That's going to go in my Lisa place. And I'm going to call it SAS final. If you run that little chunk of code, hit F3. You should now have a new SAS file in the folder with everything else. So what happens, let me comment this out, if I forget the set? So let's pretend the second line here, the set, isn't here. What happens if I run that? It will overwrite the permanent file with an empty sheet. That's right. So I rarely work with the file, the files. I immediately bring them in, and I tend not to send things back out. Um, it's uh, you have to be very careful. If you were to do this process and forget the run, for instance, it won't go. It, you, may, you may see a message here that it's waiting for something. If you run everything and it looks right, but it didn't happen, make sure that you have hit the run. Questions? All right, with me so far? Okay, now I'm guessing none of you have SAS data sets, otherwise you wouldn't be here, right? <laughs> so how do you get other things in? This, the way to do so is completely different. I am going to teach you a trick that makes it more similar to defining a library. It's the same concept, but executed differently. So now we're down under the heading Importing and Exporting Files from Other Programs. So the nice thing about libraries here, for instance, is you write the path one time. And then everywhere else on your page where SAS reads this SAS path or it reads this Lisa, it knows you're talking about this place. So what happens if you decide to reorganize your folders and add a subfolder? That could happen. Well, you need to change it one time. If you need to change the name of the directory that you're sending things to, you change it one time. And everywhere else, when it reads that, it knows to refer to the new place. As opposed to writing it out the first time and then writing it out again and writing it out again and writing it out again, which is really inefficient. So the trick I want to show you to work with other kinds of files in the same way is for the same reason, so that you only write the path one time. So this makes use of what's known as a macro variable. It is, it is a variable that is a syntax variable. It works like find and replace, the same as a library. To define it, it's percent sign and then the word let. 
and you'll note that it's in blue. The variable I am defining instead of SAS path, I am calling else path because it's the path to any other kind of file. And here's an example of what it would look like. Note the difference here, there's no quotes. The quotes are gonna come later. We are defining a placeholder for the interior of the path. And I'm calling it else path. So since this isn't where my stuff is, I'm going to borrow the text that I used earlier, just the interior of the quotes, copy it, and I'm going to fix this one with that. Once you've done so, highlight just that line let for else let else path equal and then hit F3. So it's not a SAS library, which means that it won't show up in your little list of yelling, yellow filing cabinets. Nothing will happen when you run it. You're just having it store that information for use later. The way that we are going to refer to it later is by taking the same word and putting in front of it an ampersand. That's the uh, special key above the seven. And concluding it with a period. So when SAS hits that combination, ampersand, word that's been defined with let, ended by a period, it goes, oh, it wants me to go find what else path was. It finds it and replaces it with the definition. So then if you need to update your file location, you change it once in the definition under let, and then everywhere else that it sees that combination, it updates it automatically. So here are some examples of when you would use this importing and exporting other types of data sets. So here's what an SPSS import and export would look like. Um, all types of data, except for things that are um, like text files that are not delimited by commas or tabs or anything, like most types of data that's delimited in some form, uh, SPSS, data, Excel, I'm guessing our data files probably can be imported this way. Anything that has a format, um, it's the same sequence, proc import, data file equals. So note the equals here. This trips up people. Data file equals is a sub option of proc import. So it's like, what, what are you doing? I'm importing. Oh, okay. What do you want to import? Data file equals. That's different than data up here that's all by itself without an equal sign. Data up here all by itself makes a SAS data set. Data with an equals is an option to whatever proc that you're doing. So here is what it would look like if you wanted to type out the full path to your file and then put the name and the extension. Out is what you're going to call it in SAS. So you list the SAS dataset name you are creating in this process. So I'm saying work is where I want it to go and it's gonna be called SAS file in this example. Uh, DBMS is database management system. Um, there's one called SAV, there's another one called SPSS. I, there's a whole, whole bunch of them. If you ask the Google about SAS proc import, you can get the whole list of kinds that it recognizes. And then the last option here which is not blue for reasons I don't know, says if you've already made it, go ahead and write over it. I usually keep that option because if I'm working with the data set and I screw something up and I want to start over again, I want to be able to rerun this proc import and replace it with a fresh copy.
So the code immediately after this is equivalent. You spot the difference? Else path, exactly. So I've taken this chunk starting after the first quote and ending at the end of the path name and replaced it. Ampersand, else path, period. Or else path was defined up here. Is that um, it is necessary in some instances, but not always. I think it's good programming practice just to include it to be explicit. And so then we pick up with the part where we stop the file and then the name and the extension. So if you write it out the long way, the path has to be updated every single time you change where it goes. If you do the else path, you only have to change it once. So let's practice here that one real quick. So I'm going to start from else path. We want to import the file named SPSS practice. So double click on that. And where does that go? Does it go here or here? Yeah. The, it's it's going to be this one because it's SPSS practice is the name of the SPSS file. So it's going to go where this SPSS file was before. So I'm going to copy that, change it here. And since I want to keep the names consistent, I'll just put it there too. Now, if you run that, hit F3. In your work library, you should now have another data set called SPSS practice, and there it is. Do any of you work with SPSS files on any regular basis? Or Stata data set files? You do? Okay, let me introduce you to a quirk that SPSS does. I double clicked and opened this file. Do you see all of this, these words? These are value labels. The data behind them are numbers but you can't tell what the numbers are. There's no way to toggle this and get back to the numbers. And when you try to run analyses with these variables, it changes the ordering to alphabetical, not numeric. Giant pain in the ass. So the workaround is to strip the formats out of the data, store them someplace else so that you can refer to them and then you have the original numbers. So that's what this little piece here does. Just as an example for you, let me put this. So at this point, we now have a SAS file. So all of the data commands that you would do are going to be data and then sent and then run things because SPSS is done. So now I'm on, in my copy here, line 152-ish, and I'll point. So what I'm doing then is making a copy of the data set in the work library that doesn't have the labels anymore. So, I'm, so data, make me a new data set. Where is it going? Work dot, what's my name? SPSS file underscore no labels. So you can use special character underscore to, to delineate words in your names. Where is it coming from? set work the original SPSS file. So up to this point, it's just making a copy of the data set with a new name. The difference then is this format statement and then underscore the word all underscore is a keyword. That means all the variables in the data set. Normally, format is used to apply formats. In this case, it's used to get rid of them because you never told it what format to replace it with. So if you run this, Here, I'll put this SPSS practice here and run it to show you what it looks like. Now the numbers are back. 
and we would know what to do with. So that's just one quirk of SPSS data sets that have labels. I think SAT, uh, STATA, the same thing may happen. I'm not sure about other formats. Um, there is a way to save the formats as a data set so that you can refer to it, so that you still have that key as to what the numbers actually meant. Um, so here's just some instructions if you want to change the, uh, the defaults in your SAS system. So I'm double clicking on these data sets to show you what they look like. Unlike other packages, the data cannot be open while you're doing things to it. It will yell at you. So at the top, you'll note these are variable labels that are shown. If you want to see the names, that's under view. And there's two options here for column labels or column names. If you switch to names, then you can get the original names. And the instructions here just show you how to customize your SAS to actually make it show the names as default if you want to do that. So let's say that you do all your stuff in SAS, but you need to create another type of data set to send back to someone else. No problem, proc export. So it's the inverse. Proc export says, okay, what data set do you want to send out? So it would be the, SAS, the name of the SAS data set. Out file, where do you want it to go? And then what kind of file do you want to create? an SAV file. And again, these two things are equivalent. The difference is that the second one uses this else path abbreviation so that you don't have to type the path again. So, I think that's straightforward enough. Questions on import and output. So here's what it would look like for Stata. The big difference DBMS is DTA, which is the extension of Stata data sets. So this is where I'm saying if you need to import something into SAS and you don't have one of these examples, ask the Google for SAS proc import DBMS option and you'll get a whole list of all the different types of files you can import. To export back to Stata, it looks the same, just changing the DBMS here. Um, Excel. I have a lot of folks who work with Excel files for data entry and want to import um, those into programs. It looks pretty much the same with uh, two exceptions. So here's a proc import for an Excel file. I'm just going with else path now since you probably get the idea here. Uh, the difference, can you spot the difference between the first one and the second one? The extension, yeah. So this is the old Excel files, XLS extension. And you can either use DBMS equals the word Excel or XLS. It depends on your operating system, which one will work. Uh, the new one, XLS X. And then the DBMS is XLS X. The other thing that's different is because Excel can hold multiple sheets of data. If you have more than one sheet, you have to tell it which one. Stands to reason. So there's a sheet option. So the first line is all one semicolon here. Like all of these things happen first, semicolon. Then there's a next set of options, sheet equals. And you'll note that sheet name here is in pink. What does pink mean again? Case and space sensitive. Got to get it right or it won't read it. Get names equals yes. Can you guess what that does? It takes the first row of your Excel workbook and reads them as variable names. So you don't have to type them all. Now what happens if you don't obey the naming conventions though? If your variable, if your column headers have spaces, for instance, or characters that aren't allowed, it converts those to underscores. So the names will be not exactly what you typed, but they'll be pretty close. So I have a little practice thing, but I think we can skip that. 
um, we would just change the name of the file, the name of the sheet, and then here's some proc exports. So proc export into Excel is actually something I do all the time. Um, I'm sure there's an R analog and I don't know what it's called, but one of the things you can do in SAS is save pieces of output as data sets. Like if you have a table of parameter estimates that you want to put into a nice table for a manuscript, you can save the output as a data set and then say export that data set into an Excel file. And then you don't have to type the numbers. You just make them formatted pretty and call it good. So it's a way to work with output more efficiently. Um, so I end up saving things to data sets and exporting them into Excel so that I don't have to type output by hand ever. Um, CSV files, your homework. Each of you is going to download an individual data set for your homework. Um, they're generated with random data in which your ID number is the seed. So each of you gets your own version. I am going to use CSV files as the format because they're very um, easy to work with and you can open them up in any program and look at them. And so here is what it will look like. I will give you this part here to start with. Every time I give you an assignment, I'll give you a little syntax file to get you started. But just to familiarize yourself with what it looks like. Proc import data file equals, what are you trying to import? What do you want to call it? DBMS equals CSV. Data row equals two is which row to start importing from and get names equals yes or no, depending on whether you want to read the first row as the variable names. Um, how to export to CSV. Um, do you guys use M plus at all? Yep, okay, so M plus only takes text files as input It'll take DAT files or CSV files. I like CSV because when you double click on it, it opens in Excel and you can see what it's supposed to look like. So here is how you can create a CSV file for use in M+. Uh, the catch is that you want to, to have a, there's an option in here uh, for whether or not you want the names at the top. I think it's like write names equals no or something like that. So I have to look that up. Um, I have another example elsewhere for that. But this version will give you the names at the top so that you can see what it's supposed to be. All right, hey, come back. There we go. All right, how are we doing? You feel like we're making friends with SAS? At least acquaintances, maybe? Getting, getting to know each other a little bit. Right. So then uh, basic stuff that you may want to do to a data set. Sorting. If you want to run models separately for different sets of rows, there is an option to do that, but your data set have to be sorted in the order that delineates sets of rows first, for example. Um, if you want to merge data sets together, they have to be sorted on the merging variables first. So to sort data, it's fairly straightforward. Proc sort. And then again, just the word data and equals, meaning this is the option for the sorting command. What data set do you want me to sort? Work dot, the name of the file. What variables do you want me to sort by? And here you list as many as you want in the order in which you want them sorted by. The default is ascending. You can change it to descending if you add that keyword and it will turn blue. Um, let me see if ascending, is that how you spell ascending? I think so. It's not blue, so it should be, but maybe it's just because it's uh, implied. Here is a more um, advanced use of proc sort to be able to screen for duplicates. I do this pretty frequently, so I thought I'd show it to you. If you have a data set where you want to kick out the duplicate cases into a separate file so that you can study them and make sure that they're either duplicates or they are errors somehow, uh, proc sort data equals the name of the file. There's an option called no dupe key. And then out equals the new file that you're sorted. So if you have a file that has duplicates, this line of code creates two new files. There's the no duplicates, now good version. That's the out. 
so it saves a new copy that's sorted and cleared of the duplicates. And if you want to know what those duplicate cases were, they go into this dupe out file. It screens for duplicates on the variables that you list here. So in this case, I have two ID variables that I'm screening for duplicates on. If you wanted to screen for duplicates on the entire data set, that's where the keyword underscore all underscore could be used instead to save you a lot of typing. Um, as I said, sorting is a prerequisite for merging. Um, sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't. It's just good practice to sort just in case it covers your basis. Um, in different programs, there's different ways of merging data. In SAS, it's the same. So you can use everything that you want to with one thing here. So I have two data sets that I want to, to merge on two ID variables. So for instance, in longitudinal data, you'll have an ID for which person is which, you'll have an ID for which occasion is which, time variable here. I sort each data set by the same ID variables, and then I merge. So first thing here on line 317, data work dot data both. What am I doing? Making a new one. The new one, it has a different name. You don't have to do that, but I did here. So I have a new data set about to be created called data both in the work library by merging. So instead of having set as to where it's coming from, it's coming from the result of this merge. So I have data one and data two, and it's merging by these two variables. So this is what's known as a, a column merge, where each data, data set has the same rows, but they have different columns. If you wanted to add rows that have the same columns, then you don't need the by. It would just concatenate the rows on top of each other. There are, um, the order of these things matters. So we'll see specific examples of this in terms of dealing with variables uh, that have different units of analysis. So for instance, let's say that data one was a longitudinal file in which each occasion and each person had their own row. So if I had four occasions, say, person one would have four rows, person two would have four rows, person three would have four rows, right? But data two, let's say that that's um, demographic information we collected about the person only at the first occasion. What we want to be able to do is to take person one's information and copy it down all their rows because person one's demographics apply across all of the occasions. So the order of doing this is important. You want to have the, the file that has more detail first, and then the next file will merge it in and fill it down as it goes. Now the catch to this, if you have any variables that are the same, the second one overwrites the first. How you get around that is a special option that I can show you how to use if you're in the situation called update where if you have a master data set and you're just gonna add missing information into it, but you don't wanna overwrite what's already in the master, then update is here instead. You write the master and then the things that are to add information. And so the secondary data sets only have the information copied in if they were missing in the first data set. It doesn't overwrite it completely. So again, if you're in a situation where you have to do a complicated merge, let me help you because I've probably screwed it up before and I can save you some trouble. My general rule with uh, homework assignments and fighting with code is the 15 minute rule. I was taught this by my first stats professor. If you try it something for 15 minutes and you don't get it, stop. Send me an email. 15 minutes is it. That's where you know the asymptote is of progress. You can't figure it out in 15 minutes on your own. Just stop and send me an email. So if you want to um, subset data to only certain variables, there's two ways to do that. There's keep and there's drop. They do the opposite. So in this first example here, if I only want to keep certain variables, I can list them on a keep statement. So for example, here I'm on line 335. I make a new data set called shorter data file from the original data set that only has three variables. Sure. 
Um, if it's the case that instead you just want to get rid of a few and keep most of it, it's probably less typing to do it the other way. So if I substitute keep for drop, it does the opposite. It saves everything except the ones that are on this line. If you want to reorder variables, then there is a command known as retain. It goes before set, but that allows you to write out the order of the variables that you want. So like if you make a new variable and you want to move it to the front, then you can write the name of that new variable on retain. And if you don't mention it, it stays in the file in its original order. If you want to drop certain cases, not variables, but rows, there's a couple ways to do this. There is an, uh, an option known as where. So you can subset your data in a new data set that only has certain cases, or you can subset an analysis. If you know that you have a bunch of analyses to do where you want to kick out certain cases for all of them, it can be more efficient to make a smaller data set to work with to do those analyses. So for instance, if I only, if I have a gender variable and I want to keep the people who are coded one, who happen to be girls, I would say, make me a new data set called girls only from the old data where sex equals one. Where it means if. You can actually type if instead, but I think where is sometimes more transparent. Uh, you can have it use logic. So if I want to keep people who are in group one and who are girls, where sex equals one and group equals one. You can do or, those kinds of things. Um, one that you will see from me in this class is a specific option here that is a function. So this function here is called nmiss. The, what's known as the arguments or the things that the function operates on here is var1 and var2. nmiss is a function that means number missing. So when I say where number missing of these variables equals zero, that says only keep the cases where they're not missing these variables, meaning keep the cases that are complete. All right, we're doing good, we're getting there. Let's see. Okay. Right. Questions so far? So I'm assuming that you want to be able to take your output with you places and not have to, to uh, queue up the virtual machine to open things. So I wanted to show you um, some ways to do that. Um, I tend to send output to either an HTML file, an Excel file, or a Word file. You can send it to PDF files, you can send it to all kinds of things. So this is another example of where you can ask the Google for additional places, but here's a few that I would use. Um, so ODS in these commands stands for Output Delivery System. It's syntax that allows you to save your results to some kind of uh, non-SAS file. So in this example here, I'm making use of else path again here. So this is where I want it to go. ODS is the command that starts it. The next word here is what type of file you're creating. So for instance here, I have HTML, and the one down here I have RTF, which stands for rich text file. Um, Interestingly enough, HTML can be read by Excel. So that's the mechanism by which you can export things into Excel files. Um, because this is a very customizable process, you have a bunch of different styles that uh, it's waiting for me here that you can uh, opt from. Um, for instance, minimal strips out any formatting, just gives you raw text. That can be helpful sometimes. Um, there's one here that I like when I do things to send things to Word documents. It's called Fancy Printer. <laughs> there, there's all kinds of, um, basically, what are they called? Uh, 
CCS files? Do any of you work with like web pages and stuff? No, it's it's basically um, code that tells it how to format stuff. Like you can make it pink, you can make it blue, you can make it whatever you want. So SAS has a bunch of these different formats that you can look at your output in. The default that it will go to is something called HTML blue, but there's all kinds of other ones. If you like green better, you can change it and make it nice and green. There's like beaches, there's black and white, there's all kinds of pretty stuff. So uh, you can have fun playing with those. Now SAS is mad at me apparently. But uh, it, while it's spinning here, I'll point out that these commands have a beginning and an end. So we have ODS HTML. That is the beginning. So it opens up a file and it's waiting for you to put stuff in it. And so then you'd run all of your analyses, you generate all the output that you want to save. And then when you're done, it's like, okay, I'm waiting for you. How do you tell it to close the file? ODS again, the same destination, HTML or whatever it is, and then the word close. So if you forget this, you won't be able to open the file or do anything with it. It'll be locked by the, uh, the computer. So just like we have HTML close, we have um, RTF open and close here too. HTML is what you will get um, whenever you run analyses, you'll get another window that shows up over here on the right side with your output. So it's if you want to take that output and save it someplace that's permanent. Um, otherwise, it just dies at the end of your session. And it's mad at me, and so I think that's a, a sign that <laughs> it's time to go. So, questions? All right, so um, I will finish this on Tuesday. I don't know how long it will take. We will see. Um, if you haven't already done so, homework one is posted. Um, let me see if I can get, come on, get out of there. Here, let's close the program. Yeah, I don't need that right now. Um, on the web page, homework one is due on February 1st, a couple weeks from now. That's where it is. So I have a, a Word document that has instructions and two data sets, an Excel data set and an SPSS data set. Everything that I am asking you to do is in that syntax file that we're looking at. There's nothing you have to look up on your own at all. The question is just finding the section of code that's relevant, changing the names of things to make it do what you need to for the assignment, running it and making sure that it's right. So you are able to start working on uh, probably about the first half of that now. And um, you'll submit it into the Canvas system. And all I need is your .sas file, because I can tell from that whether or not the data sets are going to be cr uh, created correctly. So that will be due in a couple weeks. <sighs> Anything else before we adjourn? Okay, then have a great weekend. Stay safe in the snow, and uh, I will see you on Tuesday. Thank you. Thank you.